This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Good morning. and Happy New Year. We welcome you this morning to worship at Triune Mercy Center. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we welcome you this morning. If you are new to Triune, I want to say welcome. And I also want to say that um, feel free to move around to go to the restroom in the service, which is to my left, your right, um, through these doors if you need to do so. Also, today, right after the service, we serve lunch. And lunch is for anyone who cares to come and eat. Um, and we would love for you to come and join us. And that will be right after the worship service. You'll go through these doors into the dining hall. And we would love to have you join us. Also, this morning, you notice the Christmas tree is still up. So we are celebrating Epiphany. And I'll talk about that more in the sermon. But um, Epiphany usually takes place on January the 6th, which was yesterday. So we decided to prolong keeping the tree up and to celebrate Epiphany today. So we will enjoy the tree for one more week um, and enjoy the beauty of, of God's light. Hopefully, even when the tree is gone, amen? That's right. So um, also, I want to thank Charles Anderson for his piece of art. I know that there's a glare on it, so I will try to explain it. But art is always in the eye of the beholder, amen? And so this art piece to me spoke to me. It has a mailbox, which to me sometimes signifies home or where you get your mail, okay? And then there's a path on a long country road. So I just want you to remember that when we get to the sermon. But that was my quick take on Charles Anderson's portrait, which may have nothing to do with what Mr. Anderson had in mind. But, you know, I love art, and I love that God uses it to touch us um, in many different ways. So thank you to Mr. Anderson for his gifts and sharing them with us this morning. Also in your bulletin is a brief explanation of Epiphany if you'd like to know more. I tried to put some information in there. Also in your pews, there are index cards. We're real fancy around here. And the index cards have um, a place where you can write prayer requests on them or joys that you want the staff to lift up in prayer, celebrations, um, and hard things as well that we lift up in prayer. And then you fold those or, or just stick them into an offering pouch when they come by, and we will lift you in prayer. There are also our cards that are laminated with QR codes um, in your pew if you don't like to give the old-fashioned way, there's a QR code, and you can take your phone out and take a picture of that if you want to do that. Um, there are many ways to give, and so we give God thanks for that. Also, um, we are going to be celebrating all throughout the year, but I wanted to give a special round of applause to our musicians um, for Christmas and for all that they did. And we celebrate them all the time, but we, you know, we are all here to give God glory. Amen? We come to worship God. So let us stand, if you are able, and greet one another using the phrase on the front of our bulletin, you are God's child and you are welcome in this place. One more quick announcement. Um, if you are in need of prayer and would like to come up during the last hymn, you are invited up to the altar railings for prayer. Um, we will have communion today, and we will give out instructions for that 
Uh, but we will basically have three stations and you will come up for communion and the ushers will let you know when it's time for your pew to come forward. And we will have gluten-free options here at the center. But um, you will come through and go back to your seats and we will all do it and do it well. Amen? Amen. So without further ado, let us turn our hearts and our minds and our souls over to the worship of our living God. I would like to invite Amanda Vaughn to lead us in this morning's call to worship. Although we have no star to guide us, Although we have not been brought to our knees like the ancient um, magi. magi. Our desire is to worship God in the name and power. We do not bear gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth. We offer food and welcoming beauty, justice and friendship, forgiveness and gospel. God has made salvation available to all human beings through Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. God's story continues. Good news abounds. There is a living Christ to discover, worship, and serve. Let us rejoice and be glad as we worship God. All right. Amen. Yes, thank you, Amanda. If you are able, please get out your United Methodist hymnal with the flame and the cross and turn to hymn number 254 and stand if you are able as we sing We Three Kings.
The Gospel of John tells us that the basis of our judgment is this. The light came into the world, and people love the darkness more than the light. We confess our sins to God, to whom we have access through faith in Christ. And we confess at the baptismal font, the place where we remember God's grace in baptism. We remember that God forgives. And we come in boldness and confidence, not according to our merit, but according to God's grace. And so let's pray together our prayer of confession as it is printed in your bulletin or on your screen. Almighty God, as the church, we are part of your redeeming work in history. Yet we know that often we seek our own success and salvation and fear to follow Christ in commitment to a vision of wholeness for the world. Help us to speak and act our parts in the great drama of your love, bearing Christ's light in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, hear the good news. God, through Christ, has forgiven each one of us and calls us to take part in the drama of redeeming love. Praise God, whom accepts and uses our very human lives in the unfolding story of salvation and new life. Amen. It's been a long dark night And I've been waiting for the morning It's been a long hard fight But I see a brand new
people said. Amen. Amen. On this, the first day of a new year in 2024, I've been thinking a lot about standing at the crossroads and discerning which way to go. How do we as followers of Christ know which road or path to take? So let's explore this together as we celebrate Epiphany, which means manifestation or appearance that takes place every year on January the 6th. That's also known as Three Kings Day, often attributed to when the Magi follow the star and pay homage to the Christ child. But first, a quick aside. Click and clack, the Tappet brothers. Who were the car talk guys on the radio, or I should say car talk, from Boston? They used to make up words all the time. I love them for this. I make up words myself. But chief among the invented words was stupiphany. According to click and clack, a stupiphany is to realize suddenly that you've been an incredible doofus. <laughs> Was it such a stupiphany when the wise ones arrived at Jesus' door? The real word, though, is epiphany. And these are the days of turning from the birth to the aha moments in our lives. Epiphany is a season reflecting on the revelation of God's gift of Jesus to this world and God's ongoing work through Christ in today's world. It is a time that reminds us of how Christ's light continues to guide our lives every day, even when the tree is down. Amen? Among those helping God to do the revealing in today's biblical story are the wise men, or the three kings, as they're popularly called. Today's story is unique only to the Gospel of Matthew, yet these magi seem to make the cut in many, if not most, nativity sets. I've also added in today's reading a verse from the prophet Jeremiah, about standing at the crossroads. But before we turn to God's word for us this day, let us first pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit God's people said. Amen. Amen. Listen to a word from God found first from the prophet Jeremiah in one verse, chapter 6, verse 16a. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths, 
where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. And now from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, let us continue to listen to God's word for us this day. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God. The various images of the three wise people on Christmas cards or on children's books are different from the limited information we read about them in Scripture. So much we make up. So much has been made of the story a story about which we know so little. My mom and dad always told me I was good at exaggerating. The Magi, translated as wise persons or astrologers or even magicians, were persons capable of interpreting the stars and dreams. They are indeed wise. But their wisdom is more of a trade or a science. We don't know how many men or women, magi, there were. That's right, I said it could have been women as well. We don't know. Neither are we told that they were kings. We three kings or magi or astrologers. We also aren't told how long it took them to get from Bethlehem, or how old Jesus was when they arrived. Those scholars think around two years old. Two. Wasn't Jesus just born last week? Two. Some scholars think that, you know, there's, there's several maps, and some scholars think that they kind of know the possible route. One of my friends posted it on Facebook, and it got a little chuckle. A very long journey, though, I think we all can agree upon. Whether it was on camels or by foot, these magi, no matter how many there were, followed the star. They risked danger. They took a journey fraught with uncertainty. They risked it all to follow this star. What we do know is that these outsiders from the east traveled from Persia, modern-day Iran, to Bethlehem. 
a journey of more than around a thousand miles. That's a long distance, whether by camel, there were no electric camels back in the day, or foot. These magi were weird, mysterious, and intriguing Gentiles showing up in a foreign land, searching for a child they had yet to meet, nor knew much about. However, they knew that his birth was very significant because they knew that he was king of the Jews. The star in the sky that they followed was so bright that they probably wondered if it was real or just a mirage in their very own imagination. Nevertheless, they trusted, amen? As important as details are, maybe the point here is that something beyond the Magi was calling them. And it was a tug that they had been waiting for all their lives. One of my favorite outdoor Christmas decorations near where we live is a simple large star nestled high in a tree. I've driven by it recently, hoping that the owners of the star were honoring the 12 days of Christmas, and there it was, the star of wonder, shining brightly in the night. Many surrounding decorations had been removed, but that star, with royal beauty bright, shone right there. Interestingly, the star in today's biblical story does not immediately lead the Magi to Jesus. Rather, it leads them first to King Herod, who goes by the title, King of the Jews. Now, Christmas isn't all sweetness and light, as Herod cannot be avoided. At our staff meeting this week, one of my colleagues chuckled and said, well, they could have been all that wise stopping by to see King Herod. However, when you're looking for royalty, where would you go? The star leads the Magi to the capital city, where perhaps they perceive the child, the royal child, born king of the Jews, would naturally be. And it leads them to Herod who seems to only be concerned with preserving his own position, title, and power. Herod, Herod the Great was king when Jesus was born, and he was a brutal, insecure ruler who lived in a constant fear of being overthrown. And thus, he was easily threatened. Know anybody like that? Keep in mind also that Matthew is making several efforts to bridge the prophecies from the Old Testament to this epiphany of Christ's birth in the New Testament. So when the Magi arrive at Herod's palace and ask him the provocative question, where is this child who was born king of the Jews? We can imagine how this news may have put Herod on high alert. We are told this news not only frightens Herod, but also all of Jerusalem with him. The power of fear is palpable, my friends. It is easy for a leader to share and to use it to their advantage. Jesus' reign continues to threaten rulers even to this very day. I imagine with the fear, panic ensues in Herod's palace. In a way, though, the Magi's arrival should be expected. After all, the chief priests and scribes would have known that the prophet Isaiah had prophesied that all nations would stream to the Lord's mountain. But few imagined that they would arrive with horoscopes, fragrances, and nature religion. Herod, with his anxieties high, goes and gathers his priests and his scribes and secretly asks them where the Messiah is to be born. Talk about an intel meeting. Those gathered tell him that the birth is predicted to be in Bethlehem of Judea, just as Micah the prophet had told. 
Then Herod, with new knowledge and maybe feeling a little more confident and secure and in control, also secretly calls in the Magi and learns from them the exact time the star appeared. Herod then lies to them, encouraging them to go to Bethlehem and seek this precious child, and then to come back and tell him, as he too would like to go and honor the baby. How assuming and arrogant of King Herod to think these magi would return automatically to give him the scoop on baby Jesus' location. After leaving the king's palace, the magi once again followed the same star, which seemed to be a perfect GPS, even without a phone charged. Amen? If there is such a thing. It led them not just to the town or to the street, but to the exact place in Bethlehem where Jesus was. Isn't it ironic that non-Jews who practiced astrology find the Christ child, while the religious people missed out? God sent the star to just the people who would know how to act and what to do. When the star stopped over their destination, the place where Jesus was, we are told that the Magi were overwhelmed with joy. One scholar notes, quote, Epiphany took them to a new horizon, the unexpected place of their longings and dreams, end quote. Upon their arrival and entrance into the house, they knelt and paid homage to the Christ child. Then they offered him their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Just because there were three gifts doesn't mean there were three people. Amen? This is echoed, these gifts, in the Old Testament as well. This divine meeting seems to be such a beautiful, breathtaking moment. I doubt the Magi planned on being so moved, so overwhelmed at the sight of the Christ child. But what is striking to me is where the Magi go next. They do not go back to Herod because they receive even further revelation, this time of the most direct and personal kind. Each of them were warned in a dream. Each of them were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. So they left for their own country by another road. They were standing at the crossroads and they listened to their dreams and went home by another way, a good way. They rerouted. Can't you hear your GPS? Rerouting, rerouting. Maybe because once you meet Jesus, once you encounter Jesus, you cannot continue on the same path. Amen? Amen? The Magi chose to obey God and thus refused Herod's power, his instructions to to return, excuse me, And they refused letting him know where the child was. Now that is power of what we call divine intervention in a dream. Amen? Amen. Have you ever had one of those dreams? You know, when you're standing at the crossroads and you look or listen for which way to go in your life. You're headed in one direction and then God sends a message for you to reroute, reroute, reroute to go another way. It's no coincidence that right after the Magi left to go back home another way, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a divine intervention dream, telling him to flee with Mary and Jesus at once and to go to Egypt, not returning until it is safe. The reason? Upon discovering that he was tricked by the Magi, Herod was, hmm, let me say, P.O.'d, belligerent, and extremely threatened. 
He had all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under killed, looking for the baby Jesus. Where else have we heard a similar story? This echoes the story in Exodus of Pharaoh and the senseless deaths he ordered of the male ch children in order to hunt down and eliminate baby Moses. The extravagant violence and the atrocious arrogance of these rulers is shocking. Yet in this Exodus story, the midwives, Shipra and Pura, fearing God, they refuse Pharaoh's command. Metaphorically, they too went home by another way. They rerouted. Friends, when faced by the powers of this world that may be in opposition to who God is calling us to be or where God is leading us, what does it mean for us to resist those powers, to listen to God, and to go home by another way? What does it look like for you to rebuke fear or addiction or your past and the shame and choose another way, the way of love, the way of forgiveness, what if we all, when standing at the crossroads, refuse things that have power over us? Refuse things that suck the light right out of us? And what if we choose a different way? A good way filled with new life and rest in our souls. A way that leads us to following and serving Christ. Somebody wake up your neighbor and say amen. amen. Friends, in this time of a new year, when, as Pastor Elaine preached, the resolutions are barely kept much longer than a few days, it's important to be reminded that God is always with us. Amen? amen. And at work, among us, every day of every year, guiding us through the stars or speaking to us in our dreams or in scripture or in prayer or through our community of faith. For when we find ourselves standing at the crossroads in our lives, let us listen to the prophet Jeremiah and seek the path that finds rest for our souls. I'm reminded of one of my favorite poets, Robert Frost, and his poem, The Road Not Taken. In it, Frost begins, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And Frost concludes, I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Friends, God set our stars and secures our steps in the midst of many crossroads in our lives. And we remember while standing there, that our hope is not in this new year. No, our hope is in the one who makes all things new. Amen? Sometimes we have to be open to new resources for hearing God and for divine revelation, like stars and dreams or advice from children, words of hope that come from unexpected places. So let us remember, friends, that God is on the loose, leading and guiding us to go home by another way, to reroute, because now is when the work of Christmas begins. As Dr. Martin Luther King's spiritual advisor, Howard Thurman, reminds us, quote, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, 
when the shepherds are back with their flock. The work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart, end quote. Friends, may Christ's light shine through us as brightly as the star of Bethlehem, leading others, especially outsiders, to stand at the crossroads on an ancient path and ask, which way? Then to reroute and join us in the work of Christmas, long after these decorations are put away and the carols cease. Yes, maybe you and me, me and you, will be wise ones too and go home by another way. Thanks be to God. Amen. As the Magi entered the house, they knelt in joy and paid homage to Jesus. Opening their treasure chests, they gave gifts to him. So we come into God's house today offering from our treasure chest to Christ, the light of the world. Let us give of our tithes and our offerings.
we are least among the saints, O God. Still you have given us the gift of your grace that we may share with others the boundless riches of Christ and also the resources we hold and trust. Receive now, we ask that you, that we have given today, use these offerings and use us for your plans and purposes. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Here at Triune, we participate in an open table, which means that all who long to encounter Jesus are welcome to this holy meal at this grace-filled table. We also have a gluten-free option if you need that, and it will be available here at this middle station. As we celebrate Holy Communion, we publicly remember God's mighty act of redemption in Jesus Christ, God's word made in flesh. Our remembrance stirs our faith, fuels our hope, and confirms our love for God and one another as we look forward to the return of Christ, who will bring wholeness to all the nations. We, too, have come asking for this child, wondering where that love might be born, seeking that joy that might satisfy our thirst, wandering through the shadows of so many mistakes in our past. We have come to this place where wise people, shepherds, and young women met. We have come to this place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread, where our hearts rise like yeast, a place where we stand at the crossroads and meet our newborn king of hope, and taste our most profound joy. Friends, there is something here that will satisfy our hunger and our thirst. No matter how long we have wandered here, our hearts will rise. For you see, glory lures up. Something in us longs to be one with the light of the world. And the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. You needn't be a stargazer, soothsayer, or wise person to see that gleaming light. Even the youngest child may glimpse glory. So come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table, it's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. Let's pray together. We give you thanks and praise, O oh God, because we know your story of love. We cling to these tales of our ancestors, of how you showed up in hard times, and how you rejoiced in great times, how you moved the waters, quieted the storms, turned the hearts, mended the broken, toppled the unjust, loved the angry, fed the hungry, and forgave the wrongs. We give thanks for that moment when you sent yourself here to be with us in the life of Jesus, we give thanks that even all these years later, you keep showing up, born into our hearts and our world in bold new ways every day. Through the Spirit, you are at work in us still, still hoping, still healing, still leading the way and loving us always. Holy Spirit, come into this bread and cup. Transform these ordinary objects as you change our hearts to shape and form your world with the joy you promise. Pour your grace upon us so we overflow with your love. Fill us with hope, peace, love, and joy of the Christ child, your son, Emmanuel, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was gathered with his friends, the disciples. And after dinner, he took some more bread and he blessed it and then he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Every time you eat this bread, remember me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is poured out. It's poured out, this new covenant is shed for my blood, the forgiveness of your sins. And every time you drink of this, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And come again he will. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. If servers will please come forward. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Everyone been served, he wishes to be served. Let us pray together. God of light and love, we cherish this table in this season when the nights are long and cold. Through this meal, the Christ and our neighbors, our hearts have been warmed, and we've been given dreams for direction. May we look and listen and obey, going home by another way. With gratitude, we leave here, energized to kindle your love in this world. Amen. Amen. If you would please... Grab your beige hymnal and stand if you are able and join us in our closing hymn today. It's number 217, Jesus is the light of the world.
you go out today, remember three things. The first is we don't make epiphanies happen. God does. The second one is we are called to go out and follow and be bearers of Christ's light. The third one, we look and, and we listen to God in our dreams and our prayers. And we reroute and go home by another way. God's way. Amen? Amen. And now may the love of God, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the friendship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. Amen.